Palatial Palace, Abuja My darling, how did I come to love you so? Ruminated, Anitsu Hmm, hidden prince, let me count the ways, replied Kenya. Might it be that my unclothed homage be one way, or my quick kisses and boldness another? On and on I can go, Anitsu interjected. And your wisdom assured you of this prize. He motioned, placing one hand over the back of his other hand, pressing the first hand's palm up against his Aeon heart. Yes, my love, my hidden love, replied Kenya. Will you no longer call me your hidden prince? Has my stewardship clouded your pleasure in that name? Probed Anitsu. No, not at all. You will be my emperor, never more my hidden prince, boldly answered Kenya. You cannot do this, this is not custom. I will be your consort, this suffices for me. Am I not empress? Is this not my will's expression? Madness afflicts me not, Anitsu, or in my absence, did they whisper, does so? Tell me, truly, Anitsu, did you honestly believe I would have willed it otherwise? She laughed. But your advisers and our powerful kin pointed out Anitsu. I have been around powerful kin long enough to know that as empress, my word is law, replied Kenya softly. Anitsu lowered his head like one in supplication. Thank you, I am unworthy. Oh, but you are worthy to me and so much more. And that is all that matters to your empress. She drifted closer to him. Disclose not what we discuss. No matter what pressure the great and good at home and abroad place on you until our time is right. Together we will be the rock against which all their designs will be broken, open and laid bare. Is that clear, my imperial dear? Moving closer, she whispered, My handsome imperial emperor, dear Anitsu. Empress, forgive this intrusion. Our heart and the protector of the imperial throne are requesting an audience came thought from a palatial official. I will see them, let them know. I will take their audience in the diamond throne hall, replied the mind of Kenya. Looking up into Nitsu's face, you see my hidden emperor, the manoeuvrings have already begun. Just wait, the humans will likely send an embassy to gain your confidence against our interests. You are definitely Empress Shardu's daughter, remarked Anitsu. I think they forget far too swiftly, came thought from, Anit from Kenya into Anitsu's mind. He was surprised how clear she sounded. Your voice in my head, it seems so long ago. I like it. Kenya smiled at him. I will return soon, but please, Walk with me a part of the way at least. They will not want to disclose their minds in front of you. Yes, Empress. Is that it? Yes, Empress. Is that all I can look forward to? No, no, my love. Taking her hand together, they departed that place and walked in the direction of the throne room. My darling love, we are here now, halfway. I will go no further, kiss me. Before she could respond, Anitsu swiveled Kenya around behind a tree close to an alcove in view of the herb garden, passionately kissing her until red effused in a sparkling light above her head. It was dark and the dim lights and twinkling stars aided his seduction of an empress 
and she placed her hand on his manhood, motioning to him to lift her up onto the marble ledge slightly farther back into the alcove, very much concealed from prying eyes. As he lifted her off the ground and up, she busied herself with removing those garments, concealing his hidden part, revealed it and allowed him to roll up her kente cloth gown to reveal a perfectly placed, delightful entrance perched on the ledge, providing an appropriate pathway inviting his entry, plunging her tongue deeper into his mouth and he twisting his around hers to taste her sweet lips, they embraced tighter. She enjoyed his passionate visit and he proudly exploring intensely her earthly delights. Both panting, a single finger she placed on his thick Aeon lips and with his dark chocolate hand over her mouth, palm lightly covering it, still in his mind he heard her feminine sounds softly purring, together reaching a passionate peak. She kissed him as her palm slipped down and he whispered, my beautiful empress, one more way this heart came to love you so completely. After Midnight, Kensington, London. Clip. Jula Felice, Cratolian ambassador, emerged at the Kensington building where Lady Fairchild lived. Clip. She appeared at the front door, placed her hand on the door handle. The lock relented, letting her in. How do? We're both late. Daddy says she's gone, left with an iron lady. Oh, I see the triple claws of the great cat. You must be the brand new ambassador. Trilock's replacement. Stick with me, gal, and you'll keep your head. Hunter Clovis did a double take after Jula slipped her concealed double-bladed laser sword into her other hand behind her back. Using her free hand, she removed her hood. Your freaking gorgeous head. Now what's your name, little lady? Galactic Ambassador. Jula Felis, authorised by permission of Kratolian Council to be on this planet. I'm Hunter. Hunter Clovis. United, De St United States Defence Secretary and Special Weapons Chief to the Western Alliance, hence the enhanced grade laser pistol in my hand, if you were wondering. Now, as I was saying, you, he did a thorough eye rape up and down. You need to stick real close to me and know how to stop them fuckers from snatching your head. Jula snapped back. I suppose it involves me giving you head, Hunter Clovis. On hearing this, Hunter blinked, opened his eyes. Jula stood there holding his laser pistol. Not sure if enhanced grade is good, sufficient for a pig like you. Maybe I won't need to find out if you are a good piggy, are you? Oink, oink, teased Jula. Let's start with, where did they go? I don't know, answered Hunter. Maybe a creative guess, perhaps? My data reveals you got talent. Jula lifted the laser's pistol to aim at his crotch. Well, hold on there. I seem to have a whole bunch of thoughts coming to mind. I am thinking a booja. I have more thoughts. But that pistol trained on my dick makes me kind of nervous, if you know what I mean. Your piggy eye rape all over my state-sponsored Kratolian body made me nervous too, Hunter Clovis. I sure can change my ways, bargained Hunter. Hope so, 
really do because I accept your offer and I will be sticking real close to you, as you say. Hunter grinned. There you go, little lady. And if you fuck with me, Hunter, Clovis, I will use this laser pistol to blast away a fat finger on your hands for each fuck you do me, clear? Hunter swallowed the lump coming up in his throat. A fasty one, he thought. Probably not my type, his second thought. Yes, loud and clear, Ambassador Fairlies. A pleasure to make your acquaintance. Please, let me be your guide on our beautiful planet, Earth. Thank you, but I have been here before. Now, Clipsiles, what's your angle, Mr. Secretary of Defense? Why so eager to overlook the real risks? Hunter's eyes enlarged. I'm no snitch, but ten fingers and my dick are in this hag's firing line, he thought. Oh hell, what to do, what to do, became Hunter's existential patriotic predicament. His self trumped nation, at least in Hunter's mind, and he spilled out all he knew, thus proving ambassador Jula Feliz very skilled at the art of persuasion. Clip, she was gone. Leaving the laser pistol in the spot she occupied a moment ago, Hunter felt dirty, looked around. No witnesses caused the feeling to linger a minute or two. Then he smiled. Ooh-wee! That was close, he laughed out loud. <laughs> it, it released the pressure. He used the bathroom, flushed, sprayed it with the United States government issued travel bleach to mask his scent, then left Fit Lady Fairchild's home en route to catch the next Hyperloop, departing from Waterloo Station to join the President on his Abujan trip. Kratol, Enceladus. Ariane lifted her head. Guards? Guards! Where am I? Are the executions over? Trapped! I missed it! Oh, for the sake of Saturn's rings, where are my guards? Diana emerged into her field of vision, causing her to pause her streaming thought for a hot minute. Then she gushed, Diana! My darling, you are safe. I was worried you would be laser bolt blasted collaterally in the interests of civil administrative expediency. We are a dictatorship now, and we need to curtail our enemies' excesses. Diana interrupted. No, my love, you need to rest. We are not a dictatorship. It was all a terrible nightmare. But I'm here now, and I will remain with you until you recover. Streamed thought from Diana. Thank you, my darling, but you are mistaken. I cannot remember issuing a re-establishmentarianism order. Perchance, my love, is there data proving I did? Came inquiring thought from Ariane. No and no, and it is time to snap out of it. Oh, Diana, are you sure you don't require another moment with the medic? I can recommend his slumber drugs, but don't be gentle with him. These people need a firm hand. Now that we are both dick, her thought was interrupted by thought from Diana. Ariane, no. You were in shock because of what happened to me and because you are pregnant. Pregnant? Came loud thought from Ariane. Yes, with twins, replied Diana's mind. Suddenly, Ayaria and Diala came thought from Ariane. How did you know their names? They just told me, like Macrollis did when we first knew he was arriving, back in the garden at Kraline. It seems a million cycles ago. Ariane teared up. Oh, Diana, I miss Macrollis. I know he is indestructible, but I miss him. More now that he has sisters on the way. He will need to know they are asking about him. 
What do I say, Diana? Help me. They are angry with me. They won't stop crying, questioning. Incessant questions, Diana, no, no. Tell them to stop, stop. Diana placed her hand on Ariane's tummy, laid her head back down with one side of her face on Ariane's tummy, positioning her brain up close to the life inside Ariane. The melee subsided. We are sad McQuallis is not here. Where is brother? He shapes our destiny. Channeled thought from the unborn twins, from Diana to Ariane. Diana, I cannot do this for five years. It will ruin me. They are strong, stronger than anything I have ever known, came thought from Ariane. Yes, they are. They are like me, only far beyond me. They cannot be raised on Kratol. They will consume it for fun. They will need to be raised on a larger world, far away from Enceladus. Ariane, how are you feeling? Weak, Diana, weak. They are powerful. Only you were able to settle them down. I can hear their breathing. When they move, my whole womb quakes. What is the medic doing here? I summoned him. But first I had this made for you. Diana produced a thin skull cap encrusted with all the finest jewels in the solar system, large and sparkly. Here, this is for you. You are my queen, Ariane, and I want you to wear this. Come, try it on. It is extremely light. Ariane was transfixed by the baubles. She had many gems of her own, but never had she seen such jewels arrayed in this way so sparkling, so bright. Her enhanced eyes twinkled dizzily at the sight of her gift. Oh, Diana, I love you, she purred, stretching her sapphire and crushed diamond encrusted fingernails delicately out to receive the gift. Diana helped her place it on her head, covering her hair completely, causing her to resemble a brilliant star at the centre of a system when viewed using tinted spectacles. The medic stepped behind her as she lifted her head to arrange the bejeweled cap securely into place. Then he administered an agreed-upon dosage of his now notorious slumber drug. Ariane cooed as Diana held up a reflecting surface for her to marvel in wonder at her gleaming head. Oh, Diana, it is so beautiful. I love you. I love it too. How did you know? Where did you get the baubles? Oh, so tired, so tired. I think I need a nap. Arian purred as she slept. The medic pulled a sheet up over her shoulders letting it rest just beneath her gleaming skull cap. The jewels dulled, indicating she was, a, she was sleeping. The twins became calm. Thank you, medic, came thought from Diana. She will need one dose every two cycles. That will keep the, the twins calm, but they will still be able to exert their will over her from time to time. The jewels will indicate who is doing the thinking, Ariane's thoughts will be sapphire blue, all other hues will be from the minds of the twins. The medic began to express serious thought. Diana, we cannot use slumber drugs for the term of her pregnancy. We must place her in an environment where the twins can expand their minds. Kratol is too small and Enceladus too insignificant for these unborn organic girls. How long? came thought from Diana. In Earth parlance, we have two years at the most before they take over her mind and use her body to seek out new space. Anything else? Macrolis is important to them. They may also demand she take them to wherever he is. Medic, I do not want to lose Ariane. You know our kind. We love once and once alone. I cannot 
will not live my long life alone. If I have it in my power to change her fate, I know, Diana, I am sorry. I will bring the Milky Way to its knees before I relinquish Ariane. Just find a larger world for her to stay. That will be enough, Diana. No need to destroy Milky Way. That helps no one. Okay, okay. I will start looking. Thank you. Oh, and welcome back. We really did miss you. At least you were able to take a break. I think we have been telling you that for 70 or more Earth years, finally it happened. Not perfect, but we will take it, was the medic's last thought. He clipped back to Opital. What is it, Treze? Came thought from Diana. Ambassador Fairlease has shared an optic string report with you. It is marked sensitive. Came thought in response from the cyber scribe. Thank you. She moves quick. I like that. Convey my pleasure to the ambassador. Yes, first citizen. Diana looked at Ariane. She, she remained asleep. Light flickering sparks dotted around Ariane's skull cap, indicating the twins too slept. Diana slipped out of that place into a large conference room with a different view from the main screen, out at the crystal skies and the hanging cylindrical structures, revolving slowly around the great cables on which they were suspended. Felix, said Diana, using the human tongue. Please accept our apologies, first citizen. The governor of Europa is busy. Would you care to leave a message? Responded the ice slab. Felix! Roared Diana back at the ice slab. Jupiter Tower, Europa Moon. Excuse me, Governor Felix, the first citizens of the Kratol, Diana Tap, uh, demands your immediate attention. Her authority overrides all privacy settings. Opening channel in five, four, three, two, one. Please prepare for the first citizen. Instructed the Islab network in the Jupiter Tower on Europa. Felix, I see you are busy. Diana sauntered up close to the Islab screen. Three, Felix. Our industry must be slow, remarked Diana. Felix was caught removing his penis from a young buxom female European's vagina. Both body bent backwards over a polished stone table and about to shove the said male organ into the mouth of another unattired young European lying alongside the first in the opposite direction with her facial aperture wide open, dripping saliva waiting to receive it. He carried a third on his back her chest pressed up against him, his randy enhanced hand firmly stuck to her buttocks like a belt. His free fingers tickled her naughty area. Diana, you caught me at a bad moment. Diana grinned. No, actually, I caught you at a good moment. What do you call this? Good citizenry se seminars for the young warriors of Europa. You are a disgrace, Felix. This is my personal life, you interrupted me. Overrode my privacy settings. What you find may either be, pardon my phraseology, trick or treat. But it cannot be a disgrace, Diana. With respect, what if the roles were reversed? Would you allow me to say the same? Pushed back, Felix. I do like feistiness in those I engage. Fair point, Felix. Just don't climax in that one's mouth whilst on screen. You're my brother-in-law. I don't want that image in my head. Felix nodded an acknowledgement as his penis disappeared in number two's mouth. Where did Hunter Clovis get the knowledge to build clip -siles? Diana ambled closer to the ice slab screen to observe Felix's response. It went limp, 
falling out of number two's mouth, his hand and fingers pushing up into number three, practically lifting her off the flooring, suddenly released her. She fell over in mid-pleasure, not expecting to be unplugged so brusquely. The look on his face clearly convinced number one to remove her swollen nipples from his mouth for safety's sake. A classic case of actions speaks louder than words, remarked Diana. You can go back to what or who you are doing, Felix. I have what I came to get. The Jupiter Ice Lab screen went blank. Palatial Palace, Imperial Aia. Jomo and Shira waited in the room, in the throne room. Kenya entered. Empress came thought from Shira. We were worried. We have been waiting a while. Is all well with you? Yes, protector of the Imperial throne. I was admiring a starry night, as is my tendency to do when the mood takes me. She looked at both with piercing eyes, both averted their, her gaze. She continued, Now, father, can I get a kiss before you two begin to lay down the law? Jomo could not help himself and burst out laughing. Kenya did so too as she walked over to receive her kiss. You have that effect on me. All was one step ahead, came thought from Jomo. Shira looked confused. Empress, then let us be blunt. Emperor or consort, conveyed her, her thought. Jomo's mind answered. Emperor, let us prepare accordingly. Shira, I knew all along. How? came thought from Kenya. Jomo smiled. I am feeling better than last night. I will, I want to go for a walk around the herb garden alone. It has been so long since I have been left alone with my own thoughts of the woman I love, and in her favourite spot too. I can't wait. Please excuse me. Baba, enjoy. The stars are particularly twinkly this night. I know, child. I glimpsed them in your eyes. Jomo grinned. One day you will tell me how, said Thought after Jomo did Kenia, as he drifted away. Well, Shira, just you and me. My, how time flies. For one of the enhanced to say such a thing, time must be moving quicker these days, came Thought from Shira. She looked up into the night sky. You'll be leaving soon, noted Thought from Kenia. My place is here, I am protector of the imperial throne. I would release you from that role, my dear friend and mentor, so you may follow your heart's desire. But I do fear for you, like I fear for all up there, soon to be engorged in war. No, Empress, there is no one I would trust to protect you and the Emperor to be. I must remain. Seriously? No one, great cat? Well, perhaps Barnegas. Maybe. He has pedigree and a powerful interest in protecting the Imperial throne. Now another one of his kin will be seated on it. Then so be it. Barnegas will be made protector of the Imperial throne of Aia upon my formal ascension. And you, dear Shira, will be released from that office, but you will not leave like a braggart into the night. You will leave here as Shira, blessed of Aia, and I will have created, I will have created your own emblem, the three claws fashioned to be worn comfortably across each neck. Empress, no, no Shira, I will not, not take no for an answer. Have you not noticed I intend to rebuild our people's pride and that can only be done by reverence for the past from whence we came?
Let us walk, Empress. If Joma enjoys sharing memories with starry nights, I too do. But tonight, with you as company, if you would honour this twin-headed leopard so. Lead the way, Protector. What better chaperone can an Empress expect? The two-headed leopard, and soon to be crowned, Aeon Prince Empress, strolled around the gardens of the palatial palace, exchanging stories of old Aia during her mother's adventure-filled reign. Hyperloop, London, Earth King Arthur, are you ready? Please hurry. We are about to step onto the Hyperloop. The President of the United States of America is here, declared Queen Joan to the King as he took his jolly regal time to descend the Waterloo Terminal steps down into the Hyperloop compartment reserved for royalty and VIPs. I'm coming, Joan. Stop nagging. You sound like Terence, our old nag. The Queen did not take kindly to a comparison to Terence. If Terence is such an old nag, why on earth did you give her a man's name? Maybe the name caused the nagging. The President and his entourage looked on in surprise, watching the English monarchy in common parlance, going at it. She would still nag if I called her Joan, replied King Arthur. Well, I think I never. She has been nagging about being called Terence ever since you gave her that name. So how would you know? And if I were to add, it is not nagging, rather a particularly good argument concerning the disagreeable nature of male naming conventions that are decidedly prejudicial to women. Right across the board if you want my opinion. Well, Joan, I don't believe I would have gotten that much out of an old nag, replied the king as he asked one of the president's officials to budge up so he could fit in to be seated opposite President Chance uncomfortably next to the queen. Well, in that case, I am satisfied that you accept I am not an old nag, responded the Queen, resting her hand in his, offering him a most regal smile. The King reciprocated, and they both turned to President Chance, waiting for him to bow his head. The hyperloop door slid shut, and the compartment began to move off slowly out of the station terminal. Warning! Please ensure your seat belt is secure. The Hyperloop is departing. Make sure your seat belt is secure, Joan, fussed the king. It is, Arthur. Have you perchance checked yours? replied the queen. I checked it before I checked yours. Is that not what the announcement advised? Were you not listening, my queen? replied the king. Hmm, I trust you brought your CCC with you, to snap some images, replied the Queen. Suddenly she engaged President Chance and his team with her scrutable eye. Awful, quite awful, in fact, terrible, the last time we were in Abuja together, wouldn't you say, Mr. President? Yes, ma'am. Hopefully this trip will be better, replied, replied President Chance. The ceremony was beautiful and the food display was adorable, replied the Queen. Yes, ma'am. Beautiful, added the President. Eleanor speaks well of you, Mr. President. I like Eleanor. What a pity she was not able to journey with us. I would have heard more than yes, ma'am, from Eleanor, noted the Queen. Leave him alone, Joan, nudged the King. Stop, Arthur. I am merely engaging a fellow traveller with friendly banter, replied the Queen. Sir, I mean, Your Majesty, it's okay. I am a fan of your Queen, interjected the President. He appeared to do the right thing. Royals, like pontiffs, adore prospective supplicants. Her Majesty smiled. Lovely teeth, Your Majesty, 
blurted out one of the American officials. He was elbowed by another official. Queen Joan extended the period of smiling so all could see her pearly whites within the context of her perfect deep red lipstick. She waved too, just for kicks. The officials gushed. Now she had the entire compartment eaten out of her white silk glove. Metaphorically speaking, she switched it up a bit. The Empress's mother was a dear friend of mine. In fact, we were so close, she stole my cook and I let her get away with it because we were such dear friends, disclosed the Queen. Is that a fact? replied the President. Of course it is a fact. It came out of my mouth, Mr. President. She stared into his eyes like an offended grandmother. What resistance he had retained, dissolved. I apologise, ma'am. I wish I had a chance to taste the chef's cuisine, replied the President. You did, Mr. President. He prepared the spread for the, oh, now let me see, the wedding, the funeral and the enthronement and snacks to go when we were hurriedly encouraged to leave en masse, explained the Queen. Well, I can't wait to taste his cooking at the next great event, replied the President, seeming strained at the unclear point of the conversation. Unfortunately, he retired after the event. It was all quite too much for him, and he, ex he did extremely well from Shadu's last will and testament. She leaned in closer to the president, momentarily blinding him, as the overhead spotlight caught the multitude of tiny travel diamonds that adorned her royal personage. Extremely well. The president put on his sunglasses until the queen leaned back so that he could focus on her face. We will be entering Aeon territory in 30 minutes. Please ensure your travel documents are in order. Thank you. Announced the Hyperloop AI assistant. He removed his shades. Your Majesty, what do you think about Anitsu, the former steward and current Imperial Minister? Asked the President. The look the Queen gave King Arthur was interesting. He commented, Seems like a nice, dependable chap to me. Me too, added the Queen. Both the King and the Queen turned back to the President with a gaze. Well, good to hear that. Do you think we can do business? We would really appreciate your input here. How about it, ma'am? asked the President. Well, of course, Mr. President. My pleasure. We will, of course, need to offer explanation for the terrible treatment your own population, who share some undeniable ethnic overlap with the Aeon population, receives from its own administration. And not to mention your subsequent incumbent's ghastly rhetoric toward the various former Aeon sovereignties, and not to overlook the unsuccessful attempt to invade their continent with the largest armada ever assembled in the history of our planet, to conquer, subdue, arrest and imprison his fiancée's mother. An enormous challenge, Mr. President, if I may say so myself, but believe me, my ancestors have been in similar predicaments, but I am pleased to say they were able to surmount such a mountain of woe, or pardon me, to use a colloquial American phrase, bad beef. I wish I never asked, muttered the President. What's that? inquired the Queen. Oh, nothing. I, as I was saying, where do we start? answered the President. Flattery. That has been the lesson I have been teaching you, and you're fine all white male team sitting here looking gruff. You must learn to be sincere. Aia has come far, extremely far indeed, and although they do not realise it, they are 
eager to settle their long-standing enmity matters on Earth to focus on the emerging galactic community. However, they will always remain largely human because there will be constant allurements up there, she pointed up, for their enhanced population to migrate to the many new worlds coming online in the Milky Way. With a successful outcome to this war, whatever successful means here, they anticipate the increased departure of more of their enhanced citizens. But this is a process that will take hundreds of years, so it may not exactly actually impact humans as much as we think unless we figure out how to live longer then we will have the option to live for a time at least on these new worlds. Mr. President, avoid being self-effacing. For example, she pointed at one of the US officials, that gentleman, over although I have no doubt that he possesses an upstanding character, even I would call for my, but even I would call for my crown bodyguards to be present if he attempted to approach me, far too rough a disposition to expect one who has been the victim of abuse to accept at face value. Am I making myself, am I making sense, Mr. President? I think so, kinda, replied the President. Where are the, where are the gifts for the Aeon court? asked King Arthur. President Chance looked at one of his officials, who looked at another, who turned to another, ret who returned the President's look with an all too telling look. Women, Mr. President, are not just decorous. I suspect every official here remembered to bring a weapon. Heads raised, brandishing broad smiles. Exactly, but none thought to bring a gift for the heart of Aia, something recognising his courage against Abyss, the Invincible One, or sending well wishes during his recovery, or even perhaps flowers maybe for the Empress, now it is official, or even a gift for the protector of the Imperial Throne, who is feminine and would welcome something to make her heart smile. You do yourself a disservice, Mr. President, if you fail to prepare properly for such an important trip. Without such attention to detail, you waste your taxpayers' money. Now even one female official, and not one of these Stepford men's wives, but an independent thinking woman, would have packed all these items, sent them ahead, using a reputable delivery service and still had time to pack her laser pistol. Are you getting my point, Mr. President? We are here to win over Aia, not to frighten them away, expounded the Queen. I do see, but maybe we can do this on the next trip. We don't have time, countered the President. Hmm. We live in a one-shot world. There is no next time. You are an American. And of all people, you should know that, emphasised the Queen. The President scowled at his entourage, noticing slight nods in favour of the Queen's viewpoint. And one more thing. People like to be able to relate to whoever is, is conveying the message. To state the obvious, because there are some that think the Western Alliance leadership you, Mr. President, may be missing this basic point. Aia is predominantly black African, but here I see white males with egregious grins going on a charm offensive. Oh no, no, that won't work, Mr. President. The Queen was interrupted. I told my De Secretary of Defence to handle it, but he has not been able to deliver replied the President. Oh, Hunter Clovis, if ever there was one, it would be him, remarked the Queen. Let's move on. 
Luckily for you, Eleanor and I have made arrangements using what meagre influence we possess. Of course, I will be presenting an invoice from the King and I for reimbursement. You'll be pleased to learn that we have arranged for all the missing parts of our incredibly important diplomatic pitch to be sent ahead, including gifts and American officials who look like those we will be meeting, the like of which the citizens of Aia will find disarmingly pleasurable to meet upon their arrival, announced the Queen. The officials sitting in the compartment appeared visibly relieved that the Queen of England at the behest of the First Lady was stage managing the trip. To add, we even arranged for a member of the Micronic community, an American citizen from Palo Alto to join this trip. My sources informed me that Hunter also promised to arrange that too. Your Majesty, thank you, enthused the President beginning to look more confident than he did at the outset from Waterloo. If only a thank you would suffice. If only. When we pull this off, Mr. President, Arthur and I would like a favour in return. And no, it does not involve clipsiles. Seriously, it does not. Everything else does. But I seem to be the only one who doesn't know exactly why, replied the President. There you go again. The Irons know everything. You think, just think what a healthy partnership would bring about. You'll find out soon enough what a grave problem Clipsiles present to all of us, noted King Arthur. Please be seated. We are approaching the Hyperloop Terminal in Abuja. You are now in the Aeon Empire. Please note, weapons of any kind are not permitted to leave the Hyperloop Terminal. 